Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be speaking to this um, audience. I've spoken here in um, IESA before, but um, not to such a large audience. Well, um, since five minutes has been cut from our sessions, I think I'll, I'll just have to get down to, to business first. I'll show you some charts and maps just to buttress my points, and then I shall make my argument. Okay. Um, of course, first of all, um, I'm very grateful to be invited here, you know, also, also from, as I'm from Myanmar, and we can see Myanmar, well, we're not in Sark, but um, not part of South Asia technically, but it's an edge country, or you can say a bridge country, so between Southeast Asia and, um, and South Asia, but we also a member of PIMSTEC and PCIM and the others. Okay, to get to the, uh, to the topic, the subject, the linkages between identity, statelessness, and violence are ignored or denied at our own risk. You know? and that means risk to our governments, to our society, and to the country that we live in. And also, I would say, to the immediate region. You know, when we talk about, as yesterday we covered, um, non-traditional security is not limited by borders or by regions, you know? And the spillover is, is very, very frequent. And, and then, uh, we can talk about identity and statelessness on liberal human rights and humanitarian grounds, and there is an awful lot going for doing so. But more than that, there is tremendous relevance on the security front, and I, I repeat, uh, both hard security and non-traditional security. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that a purely security-oriented approach can resolve it, you know? Although uh, traditional entities like the police, immigration and military might tend to think so. I think. Professor Ali Ashraf has also touched upon it. All right then. So, before that, let me just start with this chart. Identity first, right? Okay. So this was um, done by two scholars in Myanmar, you know, in 2016, so it's quite recent. And it doesn't get around very much, but uh, it shows the results of a survey about self-identity by religion and ethnicity. Now, green is that you identify by religion, light green by ethnic community, and red by nation. I'd like to draw your attention to the differences between the majority Buddhists and the religious minorities, and also between the majority Pama and the ethnic minorities. You will notice that the Pama and the Buddhists identify primarily by religion. No? And um, the religious minorities and ethnic minorities, less so. So this sort of belies the kind of uh, perception that the ethnic minorities and religious minorities are, well, let's say, separatists or successionists or much more devoted to self-determination and all that. I would say, I would venture to say that the rub comes because of the majority you know, the majority see themselves as with the religion first and with the ethnicity first, much more than the minorities. Okay. So after having done that, let me show you this map. This is just to anchor the whole uh, issue in a global way, in, in a global uh, context. It shows the extent of statelessness. You know, well, the estimate now is 12 million people in the world, and uh, 12 million is 12 million too many. And if you look at our region, you can see the countries which have large numbers of stateless people. And um, this shows the breakdown in numbers, you know, and over a period of three years, starting from the end of 2015, 2016, and 2017. And uh, as is to be expected, Myanmar comes out right at the top. You know. There are other countries which are also, I mean, uh, with large numbers of stateless, but this is something that could have been prevented, could have been handled, you know, and then it has grown out of proportion. Well, if you look at the um, international UN system, there are a number of instruments set to handle this, you know, and some of them have been um, around since the end of the Second World War. But then um, you see that the Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness was uh, enacted in 1961, but still, well, what, 60 years later, it's still very much around. And at the bottom, you also see the other conventions which are also related 
to um, to statelessness. And um, very recently, the UNHCR has come out with draft articles on the protection of stateless persons and the facilities for their nationalization. I think this is also needed. We have to work um, for common goals together, but at the same time, we need work on the ground as well. So we know the consequences of statelessness. You know, we don't have to elaborate too much on it. You know, and then at the end, you know that there is a huge potential for engendering uprisings and civil revolt. Now. If I may just draw you, your attention to a recent paper from the um, U.S. Command and Staff College, no less. It shows, the title is, The Social and Political Consequences of Another Stateless Generation in the Middle East. Uh, it comes from uh, one of the world's leading uh, st staff colleges. And um, it has two, three uh, case studies, um, the Palestinians, the Kurdish people, and the Rohingyas. Yeah. And I would just sort of recommend that because from a military standpoint, it shows all the, the, the great potential that statelessness has for violence and war. And this is also another recent paper. Uh, it's in kind of an editorial paper. It shows the value. The title is Pathways into Terrorism, Understanding Entry into this and Support for Terrorism in Asia. Um, of course, here in India and in the general think tank community, we know that the value of these papers, you know, they did a huge amount of interviews, a huge amount of data, but this kind of perception has to get to the uh, policymakers. In some countries, this is still missing, and there's a big gap that needs to be filled. And so, again, we come to the connections, you know, the commonalities, several of the papers in that um, journal point to a sense of personal crisis, inefficacy, crisis of identity, again, and perception of the world in crisis that makes one initially susceptible to recruitment. And there's a social component to entry. And finally, there's an increasing role for the internet. Now, because of the uh, spread of social media all over the region, I think it's more easy for people to be led or recruited into terrorism. So this is the, to end it, of course, again, to come to the United Nations system, I think, um, by the way, the Global Compact on Refugees was um, enacted also and adopted earlier this year, and I think this is a very um, welcome development. I hope people will, um, a lot of them will sign on to it and also make it work. Now, this is just a list of um, things that we need to do to end statelessness all over the world. Uh, one encouraging sign, which I may mention now, is that in Nepal, over 2.5 million stateless people were granted citizenship since 1995. That's a real achievement, you know? And uh, of course, it requires a lot of diplomatic and political will, you know? It's not just the kind of support that you get from the development agencies to do that. Okay, I've shown this. And now we come to my own country, Myanmar, and um, what's happening in Rakhine. I think it didn't happen, take place yesterday or even last year. It had its roots in the 1960s when Myanmar, you know, very unfortunately passed under a dictatorship. And uh, people might not uh, remember it very well now, but one of the first things that Dictator Ne Win did was to declare that people of foreign descent or foreign origin had to leave the country. You know, so it had a very big impact upon the social fabric and especially upon the economy. I think we are still living with the consequences of that kind of act. And if we forget that kind of thing, it's quite easy to face another round of this kind of violence. Now, again, uh, this was something that happened in 2015. You know, the the boat people that left the um, Rohingya camps and tried to sail down to Malaysia and, um, and Indonesia. On, in 2016, it's just a, a little facet about what the international organizations tried to do. I was asked to write a paper on this, and I presented that. It was in Manila, but in 2016, the next year. But at the last moment, they got cold feet and they would not publish it. You know? So that's the kind of thing. Um, if it had been published in 2016, it could have been a kind of, a, let's say, I'm not so, I mean, overplaying my, overstating my importance, but it could have been a kind of a, a warning bell, you know, because the real crisis, the offensives and the, and the counter clampdown came in October 2016 and in August 2017. Now, to look at what's happening in Myanmar, this is the situation from 1988 to 2016, you know, and um, it's just, a, it's very brief. Uh, that was the kind of standoff that the world was used to 
you know, like between black and white and between the democratic forces and the military authoritarian structure. But post-2016, we see that a different configuration has come up, and we are still with it today. You know, this morning, well, it was a very worrying report by Reuters agency, no less, that they see uh, no hope for the uh, refugees ever returning, to repatri being repatriated to Myanmar. So now we have the, the Myanmar, I call it the dual state, the military as well as the NLD government and the Buddhist extremists arrayed and at loggerheads with much of the West, you would say, no? United Nations, major democratic powers, world public opinion, and a minority of the Myanmar public. At the same time, there's also pressure within the country from ethnic national parties, ethnic armed groups, human rights groups, and students' unions. Now, this is actually my, my last um, um, map. It's, I think, quite public, and it shows, you know, after I've talked about identity, you know, self-determination, and also statelessness, okay, the result is continued conflict. And this map is valuable because it shows, A, the number of estimated battlefield deaths over a period of 30 years, and the number of conflicts. You will see that they are clustered on the eastern half of the country. You know? And that's more like, you know, um, let's say, ethnic armed organizations in conflict with the central government. But on the western border, you also see that there is some conflict on the border with Bangladesh. Let me remind you, point out, that is not with the ARSA. That is with another armed organization known as the Arakan Army, which is a Rakhine Buddhist armed organization and which is far more lethal than ARSA. You know? I think uh, the central forces are suffering a lot of casualties because of the actions against the Arakan Army. It's sort of a glossed over. People don't seem to realize that very much. Okay, then, um, as always, we have to look for solutions. We know this, the, 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 the situation is not very encouraging, dismal, you know. So I would propose, first of all, inclusive politics in Myanmar, and number two, secular politics in Myanmar. We don't want religious organizations, and religious, let's say, uh, members of the clergy and extremist clergymen entering politics and having a, 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 an, an impact. Thirdly, I think Myanmar very much needs um, a coalition structure. We've had single parties, you know, uh, ruling the country, and it's come out, come out very badly. We need to build coalitions, but at the same time, I must warn you that coalitions, are, Myanmar culture is very weak in coalitions. And fourthly, I think we need quality leadership, you know, okay for three decades or more. I mean, the overriding argument in Myanmar was that we wanted demo a return to democracy, and once democracy returns, everything will be well. It hasn't turned out that way, you know? Um, it may sound, again, discouraging, but I do not see a resolution with the presence, leadership, civilian as well as military. You know? I think this is something that I need to tell our neighbors here. At the, at the same time, there are impending elections in Myanmar. They will be handled held in 2020. And there are elections also in other parts of the region, like in Bangladesh, and also in Thailand, you know, surprisingly, and also in Indonesia. You see? So we hope that there will be uh, positive changes, but it's only a hope. And of course, uh, coming to a conference on South Asian security, we we'll look at the impact upon the region as well. The things that happen in Myanmar are not confined, as I say, to Myanmar alone. Look at what the spillover did to, to Bangladesh. And uh, yesterday, there were reflections upon the nation state you know, and definitions of security. I think we ought to uh, look deeper at, this, at these issues too. Um, well, ASEAN has the principle of uh, non-interference you know, and national sovereignty. But if we have deep and long-standing you know, conflicts you know, and weaknesses, in a neighboring country, do we just uh, stand aside and, and look on? You know, sometimes you need a lot of uh, friendly advice. Perhaps you, people in the re countries in the region might not agree with the West, you know, uh, having sanctions and resolutions and all that. But I think it's like good neighbors. I think we need to have the uh, 
the intent as well as the capability to give good advice. And uh, I see at the end, if I may just uh, wrap up, I don't see any option other than closer cooperation. Yesterday, some of the eminent panelists were talking about uh, not seeing themselves as citizens of individual countries, but as um, a citizen or an individual in the region as a whole. I think I would strongly endorse that, you know, because I think um, there are many countries, as you know, in the region, but um, states and societal capabilities are not uniform. You know? And I think, uh, to be very frank, for a country like Myanmar, I think that is something that we need to look at very deeply. Just a few days ago, the Indian president visited Myanmar and he met the top leaders, but I don't know what they actually discussed, you know. So that kind of, I think, um, dialogue needs to be uh, deeply maintained. And also, again, for events like this, I think we need to have people from the Myanmar government also attend. I'm a very independent person, uh, as you would know. So thank you very much. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, I think we will leave for the Q&A. Thank you.